Well, greetings, everyone. I'm David Arendale, and I'm here to give you a quick overview of peer-led team learning, a nationally known program for bringing academic support for students in historically challenging courses. There are six different programs which I monitor. Peer-led team learning is simply one of the six. It's a powerful program that's used not only here inside the United States, but also it's been adopted for use in other countries. The definition of PLTL, it's a model of teaching undergraduate STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math courses that integrates, and that's the key word here, integrates peer-led workshops as an integral part of the course to increase success for all of the enrolled students, especially those that are historically underrepresented. It was first created at the City University of New York, I believe during the 1980s, and it received NSF, National Science Foundation, grant support from 1991 through 2005. The goals of the program is create a seamless integration of academic support and mastery of the learning skills along with the challenging course. Most oftentimes, these are gateway courses, introductory courses in STEM majors. Particularly, you most often tend to find this in a chemistry or a biochemistry course. It increases the persistence of historically underrepresented students, in particular, along with the general student population in these historically difficult majors. There was a lot of concern back during the 1980s and 90s that way too many students were dropping out of STEM majors, particularly students who are historically underrepresented. This could be students who might be African American, uh, Hispanic American, uh, women. Uh, there was not enough diversity of the students who were graduating with majors in STEM as compared with the numbers and types of students who were enrolling in those programs. So they made a decision to do a lot of what we would call nowadays course redesign, and they ended up placing a discussion lab in connection with these courses. So very well, they could have lecture components, lab components, and also a discussion component. The major assumption about PLTL is that all of the students end up benefiting from the seamless integration. Back during the 70s and 80s, the thought was, well, let's identify students who are, quote unquote, high risk and identify courses that were quote-unquote high risk. Well, those were really inaccurate titles. They were also labeling and stigmatizing. What they came up with was that you just can't depend on voluntary participation because sometimes the students who most need to be there end up avoiding it. So they ended up saying, well, this is a positive pedagogy which we can introduce and integrate into our courses, and we end up finding that it's beneficial for all of the students who are enrolled in the class. What are the requirements to implement? Well, it takes a fair amount of work. It's integral to the course. So the course instructor, obviously, is going to be heavily involved in helping to select the materials, involved in training, supervising, and reviewing what's going on inside of these workshops. I mean, it's an extension of their course. The peer leaders, these are students who are selected. They receive extensive training and supervision for their work. These experienced people, these students here, well, whenever they come back for additional years, well, they may end up serving roles as assistant supervisors of first-year students who are serving as PLTL workshop leaders then. It's heavily supported by the department and by the institution. This is not an inexpensive program because they end up seeing that this is a part of the class. They're going to have to hire a lot of these PLTL student leaders. It's often going to be two hours a week for this discussion session. So there's an awful lot of commitment up on the front end for the institution, 
But then again, you end up balancing that with, well, what is your investment cost? So rather than thinking of this only as a pure cost, what's the investment and what's going to be the yield? And the yield is going to be more students are going to complete their STEM majors and graduate, and you're going to have a higher diversity of the students who complete which is a major objective of the professional associations as well as the professors who teach the courses. Well, how do these workshops operate then? Well, we end up having the student leader is a facilitator, and that's what's really key here is that they're not reteaching the material. They are doing using group learning, active, engaging activities, and having the students teach themselves. So this is a facilitated, it's not simply a more traditional kind of graduate um, seminar that you would end up attaching to a course where the GTA may end up going and reteaching parts of the material. That's not what goes on during the workshops. There's also a fair amount of structure, and that's one of the other characteristics about PLTL in comparison with some of the other peer-assisted learning models, is that they oftentimes have a lot more structure, uh, workbook materials for them to work through. Uh, the workshop materials, they're, all, they're challenging, they're related to the course itself, and it's useful because it helps to structure the small group learning activities which are occurring. The workshops, they're all scheduled in advance. They're part of the student schedule. So they already know whenever they enroll in this biochem course or this introductory uh, to chemistry course, they already know not only when are the lecture sections uh, sessions going to occur for the class, but also when the labs occur and also the PLTL sessions then. So this is all done in advance, two hours at a time. And there's only 6 to 12 students per each of those sessions. So if you have a class of 30 to 40, you can start seeing how many of these PLTL leaders that you're going to need then. And the student leaders, well, it all depends on the program. And looking at the literature, um, sometimes they receive pay. That's the most common thing. Sometimes they end up receiving academic credit. So it kind of depends on what the institution wants to do. Well, how can you go and evaluate how effective this PLTL program uh, has been? Well, it's already being used nationwide. In fact, as I follow the professional literature about peer assisted learning programs, I have now have an annotated bibliography that runs over 1,550 articles. PLTL has the fastest growth of articles that are being produced to describe their program and rigorous studies that help document the effectiveness of the program. It's going to require, uh, in order for you to be able to do this, some upper-level uh, support. So it's going to take a stable budget uh, because it's an expensive program in terms of real costs, but also what is it that you want to get. Once again, it's kind of like when I talked about the ESP program in a separate videotape. The same thing applies here is that what do you want to get as an outcome? A lot of faculty time is going to be involved in this. You're going to take probably an undergraduate, and then some institutions are going to require a graduate student to serve as the PLTL leader then. And as I said, oftentimes we're going to have a salary for these leaders. And also you're probably going to also going to need to give some overtime or some course release for the faculty members. So what's the bottom line? Whenever you look at all the research studies and evaluation, this is what they come up with. It's highly effective for transformation of a historically challenging intro science course for all enrolled students. So once again, it's another example of the term which is oftentimes used today about course redesign. And that's the reason why institutions are willing to make those investments. What are some outstanding research studies and articles that have come out in recent years? Well, I just simply sampled out what, five of them here. Uh, there's hundreds of those which you can be able to find if you end up looking at the uh, annotated bibliography. Um, I think that one of these articles here that I just kind of picked up at a random talks about doing this 
uh, online. Um, at the time that I'm recording this, uh, we're in the middle of March of 2020, and institutions across the United States and probably in other countries are all going to online instruction because of the flu pandemic. As I said, there's a fair amount of structure that goes along with PLTL because of the rigor that occurs during these workshop sessions. There's a couple of books that are out there that have been published by the PLTL creators. One is a handbook for team leaders. And another one over here um, is a guidebook for peer leaders, both of which I picked up as uh, use books off of Amazon. And then also I found um, some other workbooks that uh, the PLTL creators also made for use in a general organic course, a general chemistry class, and an organic chemistry class. Once again, I picked those all up through uh, Amazon as use books. Well, a key place for you to go is to the website for uh, peer-led team learning. That's pltlis.org slash and you can end up finding information on conferences, publications, uh, journals, and all the rest. They end up having an international conference every single year, lots of workshops. It's the place to go to if you really want to understand PLTL. That would be the place that I would invest some funds to go to the conference and then to go to a local college that's using PLTL and visit with the coordinator of the program, and also to sit in and watch a couple of the workshops actually occurring themselves. As I said, I'm in charge of a publication that now ranges up to 1,550 publications, most of which are all research studies. I have a real interest in peer-assisted learning. For me, my background is helping to disseminate supplemental instruction and also, as it's called in other countries, PASS for peer-assisted study sessions. That's my particular background area. But I'm interested in all of these major national models because I think that they're all instructive and I enjoy being able to share about them with other people who don't know about them. As I said, there's 1,550. If you end up going to this website, z.umn.edu slash peerbib. And if you end up going to there, you can see and download the general total bibliography. You can also download just what it is that you want. So if you want to just look at peer-led team learning, you can just download that particular bibliography. I also have a whole series of topical sub-bibliographies that come out of all of this work, and probably one of the ones that's the hottest right now of particular interest in March of 2020 is one that looks at publications that talk how they're taking these different programs and they're conducting them online. So once again, I think that this is a great place for you to come dig deeper and understand more about peer-led team learning. An enormous number of publications. I would guess probably it must be up to, I don't know, 400, 500 different publications. And many of these are in some of the most scholarly journals that you can imagine. If you'd like to know more information about peer learning, I have four different websites that you could go to. We've already been talking about one of them, and that's the one on Peer Bib. That's where you can go and look at um, the uh, annotated bibliography. So it's going to include the abstract of the article, and you'll be able to figure out, well, which ones do I really want to go read? The nice thing is that when possible, I end up having URL web links. So you can actually skip having to do going to the library or to interlibrary loan. You can actually go and download the articles themselves. There's three other websites. One of them is my general site of training materials, oftentimes by other people. And that one is that same z.umn.edu slash, except this one has the end of it, peer learning. There's also one that ends with Pubs Peer, 
And those are all the publications which I have written about peer-assisted learning, the majority of which are ones about supplemental instruction and also about peer-assisted learning, which is a hybrid model which we developed at the University of Minnesota based off of best practices of uh, the Emerging Scholars Program, peer-led team learning, and supplemental instruction. And then finally, we have a YouTube page. That's Peer Learning YouTube. And if you're interested, you can also see the summary overview videos for ESP, PLTL, SI, and the other ones. Well, they're all located there. And also, if you just simply like to be able to get together and talk with me on the phone or exchange email, well, my contact information is down there on the bottom of the screen then. Well, thanks for spending a couple of minutes with me here. I appreciate the opportunity to share about a wonderful program. I hope these words are useful to you in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Best wishes.